Uh, we started a series last Sabbath. We're going to continue on with that today. It's called Amazing Grace. This is part two. Last Sabbath we looked at the saint of God. Who was it? Who was it? Aaron, yeah, the saint of God, according to Psalm 106. But we notice that he did a few things that we would not consider him ready for sainthood. Which tells us that God's amazing grace worked in his life. Well, let's go ahead and kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for your goodness to each one of us that you show us on a daily basis. Thank you for your amazing grace that took Aaron and worked with him in spite of his insanity in spite of his foolishness, and you changed him into a saint. Thank you, Lord, that you can do and are doing the same for us. We just pray, Lord, that as we study again about another character this morning, that the Holy Spirit would speak to us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I'm going to start off the sermon a little bit different. This gentleman, I didn't tell you who we're looking at today, did I? Okay, good, good. The first person, when you think you know who it might be who we're going to talk about, uh, just call out who you think it is. But make it a, a reasonable guess, okay? You know, nothing shady. Um, God worked in this man's life for 40 years. 40 years. Uh, dramatic intervention took place uh, on repeated occasions, at least three that we know of in the Bible. He was known... He was known in Scripture as the terrible of the nations. We find that in Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 7. Uh, he was also known as a king of kings. I'm going to have to make it more difficult, Rita. You're right. It was Nebuchadnezzar. That's right, it was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar came to power, we know in Scripture and history, right about 605 B.C. We're first introduced to him. Um, of course, Jeremiah spoke about him, Ezekiel spoke about him, and then of course he was definitely a big part of Daniel's life as well. But folk, in 605, Nebuchadnezzar came to the throne. And we know in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 1, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. So the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he began reigning in 605. We're looking at 603 B.C. Now, folk, that was the first instance where we find God dramatically intervening in this heathen man's life. 
603 BC. This went on, folks. This went on for the next 33 years. 33 years. We know that because when Nebuchadnezzar finally had a judgment pronounced upon him in Daniel chapter 4, we know that that was right towards the end of his life. He died, uh, history tells us, he died in 562 B.C. Well, he went crazy for a seven-year period. Josephus, in his writing, says that Nebuchadnezzar lived about a year after his insanity. So if he died in 562, the insanity ended in 563 B.C. So from 570 B.C. to 563 B.C. is when Nebuchadnezzar became an animal. Okay? So there is the scope of this man's life. He, he, lit, he reigned for 43 years not only in Babylon, but throughout the Middle Eastern world, throughout the Mediterranean. So, folk, that went on for 43 years. At the 35th year of his reign in 570 B.C., of course, judgment was pronounced upon him. So, folk, for 40 years give or take a few on either side. God worked in this man's life to try to bring him to the place where Nebuchadnezzar was no longer the master of his life. How long has God been working in our lives? to try to bring us to the same place. It's fascinating um, the pictures that were given of Nebuchadnezzar. As we said already, Ezekiel 28 verse 7 called him the terrible of the nations. Ezekiel 26 verse 7 refers to him as a king of kings. Jeremiah 51.41 also refers to Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah 51 and verse 41. It says, How is Shishak taken? How is the praise of the whole earth surprised? How is Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? Well, Shishak and Babylon are the same thing. So Babylon was the praise of the whole earth. Folk, the picture, one picture we get of Nebuchadnezzar, he was a ferocious conqueror. He was a mighty emperor. Um, he was a powerful leader. Paul? Real quick, it's interesting that in the turn of the century, 18, 1900s, the archaeologists at the time said the Bible was untrue because in the excavation of Babylon there was no sign of Nebuchadnezzar. A couple of years after they made that statement, another archaeologist found a level where they uncovered a, a, a ruin where his blue tile, was, which was his mark, was all over the place and his name was plastered everywhere. Yeah. And they said, oh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Paul's comment for the, for the cameras is, is that um, many people believed because of excavations that were done in Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar didn't exist, therefore the Bible was not true. But um, they have since found many things in those excavations that would indeed say that Nebuchadnezzar did live, did reign, and uh, had a mighty impact in the world. So the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was a, a tyrant, he was a, a ruler, he was a, a warrior, he was a conqueror, he was a leader of men, and when he spoke, 
people didn't say, well, what they did say was how high. They did exactly what he said. He was a powerful, powerful man. He not only was a warrior and a leader, he was also a master builder. Uh, we read about the golden city that Nebuchadnezzar built in Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, the Bible says, verse 4 of Isaiah 14, it says, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased? He was an oppressive man. The golden city ceased. So we get an idea not only of his character, he was an oppressor of people, but he was also a master builder, designer. Babylon was known anciently, as Isaiah records, as the golden city. Uh, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19. The Bible says, In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So Babylon was an amazing place. Amazing place. Lots of gold, hanging gardens, walls that were wide enough for two large trucks to go down those walls, an amazing place that Nebuchadnezzar had built. So he was not only a warrior, an oppressor, a leader of men. Nebuchadnezzar also was very intellectual. He was extremely gifted as far as building things. Um, quite a man, quite a man. Prophets and Kings, page 514 and 515 tells us this about him. It says he was an idolater by birth and by training. And at the head of an idolatrous people, he had nevertheless an innate sense of justice and right. And God was able to use him as an instrument for the punishment of the rebellious and for the fulfillment of the divine purpose. There's a lot in that. He was an idol worshiper. And of all the idols, of all the idols that Nebuchadnezzar idolized, which idol did he idolize the most? Which one was it? Himself. himself. That's exactly right. Himself. And so in order for Nebuchadnezzar to be different, in order for him to change, he, he would have to be humbled in the dust. Is the only way. It's the only way. It's not surprising, Prophets and Kings 5.15 says that the successful monarch so ambitious, so proud-spirited, should be tempted to turn aside from the path of humility, which alone leads to true greatness. In the intervals between his wars of conquest, see, so he was a successful warrior, he gave much thought to the strengthening and beautifying of his capital, and it, until at length the city of Babylon became the chief glory of his kingdom. His passion as a builder, his signal success in making Babylon one of the wonders of the world, ministered to his pride until he was in grave danger of spoiling his record as a wise ruler whom God could continue to use as an instrument for the carrying out of the divine purpose. So he was not only a conqueror and a master builder, 
he was also very arrogant, very proud, very ambitious. And he loved himself. Boy, I don't know about some of those things. You know, as far as a conqueror, a, a master builder, I don't know how many of us can relate to that. But I think some of the other things, I know I can relate to that. So what would God do? How would God try to reach this arrogant? What's that? Pompous? Absolutely, Faye. Absolutely. Very arrogant man. What would he use to reach him? Well, we read about the first attempt of heaven to reach this idolatrous king. We read about it in Daniel chapter 2. Of course, a story that we've probably looked at or heard about a few times. Uh, the Bible says in Daniel 2 and verse 1 that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed a dream. Uh, he, of course, then commanded, verse 2, all of the magicians and astrologers and sorcerers to show the king his dreams. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't know what it was that he dreamed. And so he told his wise men and magicians and sorcerers that unless they could tell him what he dreamed and what it meant, that their houses would become as dung hills and they would be killed. There you go, Rita. There's a, another unattractive um, element that we find in Nebuchadnezzar's character. He had a bad temper. You didn't cross him. Uh, if you did, uh, with the position that he occupied, he could kill you. He could destroy your family. Um, yeah. Not the kind of guy you'd want to be around for very long. Not with a temper like that. So... Of course, we know that the young man, Daniel, came in, told, asked Arioch, we read in verse 15, it says that he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Daniel went in, desired of the king, he would give him time that he would show the king the interpretation. And then, of course, Daniel and his friends went home. They prayed earnestly. And in the night season, God revealed to Daniel not only what the dream meant, but the very dream itself. And so Daniel comes in the next day. In verse 26, the king answered and said to Daniel, Daniel 2.26, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, cannot, cannot show unto the king. I'm going to guess that at, at that moment between verses 27 and 28 that at that very split second Nebuchadnezzar just about said hack this guy's head off his shoulders. But Daniel stopped him. In verse 28 Daniel said but there is a God in heaven that reveal his secrets. And he will make known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. And then Daniel 
tells Nebuchadnezzar what he saw in his dream. And he said, O king, you saw a great image, and the head was of gold. And Daniel said, Your kingdom is the head of gold. So the gold in the image represented the kingdom of Babylon. But then in verse 39, Daniel said, After you, after the kingdom of Babylon, would arise another kingdom, a kingdom of silver. And then there would be a third kingdom of brass which should bear rule over the whole earth. And so Daniel begins to delineate the king's dream, the head of gold Babylon, the chest and arms of silver, Medo-Persia, the belly and thighs of brass, Grecia. And then verse 40, the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. So the legs would be of iron, representing the iron pagan Roman Empire. And then, of course, the feet would be part iron and part clay, representing those kingdoms that came out of the pagan Roman Empire that would never actually join together. And then in verse 44 and 45, Daniel told the king, the last thing you saw, O king, was a stone, and it was going to crush that image and that stone would become a great mountain and it would fill the earth. And that stone would be set up when all those nations, from Babylon all the way down to the divided empires of Europe, when all of those would be destroyed, that would be at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so this heathen king is listening. Listening to exactly what he had seen in his dream. And as Daniel's declaring each item, Nebuchadnezzar's saying, you're right, that's exactly what I saw. It's exactly what I saw. How did you know? Well, Daniel had told him there was a God in heaven that reveals secrets. And then Daniel 2, verse 46, tells us Nebuchadnezzar's response to what he has just heard. The Bible says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel. Is that a humbling position to be in? Folk, he was the king What's that, Nelly? For him, it was. For him it was. Absolutely. He's not used to falling on his face on the ground and worshiping some human being. And he commanded they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. Now, verse 47. Notice what Nebuchadnezzar said. The king answered to Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Did you notice how Nebuchadnezzar identified the one who had interpreted that dream? Who was it? It was your God. It wasn't his God. It was Daniel's God. And the God whom Nebuchadnezzar said was your God, who was he? Was he a savior? Was he a king whom Nebuchadnezzar would receive into his life? No. No. The one whom Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged was Daniel's God. He was a revealer of secrets. Interesting. 
If somebody were to ask us today, tell me about your God, how would we respond? Would we say, well, he's a, he's a God of prophecy. He's a God that, that knows the future. Is that how we would respond? Or would we say, my God is the Savior of my life. He saves me from myself every day. How would we respond? I think that, that really, as I was reading Nebuchadnezzar's picture of the God who just interpreted and told him what he had dreamed, Nebuchadnezzar said, yeah, he, he's a, he, he reveals secrets. He's a good secret revealer. But that's not what God wanted. God didn't want to be a revealer of secrets. He wanted to be the king of Nebuchadnezzar's life. And I think it behooves us to ask ourselves that question this morning. Who is our God? Who is He to us? A revealer of prophecy? Somebody who interprets and has foretold future events? Or is He the Master, the Savior of my life? We need to ask ourselves that question. I need to ask myself that question. For a while, we know in Prophets and Kings, for a while Nebuchadnezzar had a change. 514 of Prophets and Kings says, such had been the case after his dream of the great image. His mind had been profoundly influenced by this vision and by the thought that the Babylonian Empire, universal though it was, was finally to fall and other kingdoms were to bear sway. Until at last all earthly powers were to be superseded by a kingdom set up by the God of heaven whose kingdom was never to be destroyed. His mind, profoundly influenced by the vision. Profoundly influenced. Has anything ever happened in your life that has profoundly influenced you? That has shaken you up that's made you re-examine the whole direction of your life? That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Profoundly affected by the vision. But it's interesting, it does not say that he was changed for good. Not changed for good yet. It would take the amazing grace of God to do other things in the life of this heathen, idolatrous man. And so we go to the next experience in Nebuchadnezzar's life where the God of heaven was trying to save this man from himself. And it's found, of course, in Daniel chapter 3, when Nebuchadnezzar, the king, creates this gigantic image, all of gold, 90 feet high, and sets it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, why, why was this image in Daniel 3, why was it all of gold? 
Okay, Babylon was the golden city and in the image in Daniel 2, the head had been of gold and that had represented Babylon. What was Nebuchadnezzar trying to communicate by this golden image on the plains of Dura? What was he trying to say to all the people that were gathered there? What was he trying to say? What's that, Reggie? That he was going to reign forever. That's right. There would be no more kingdoms. There would be no chest and arms of silver, no belly and thighs of brass, no legs of iron, no feet of iron and clay. Babylon was the eternal kingdom. And Nebuchadnezzar wanted all the people on the plains of Dura to know that. And so he gathers all the leaders, starts the music, the people all bow down, but three young men. And when the three young men refuse to honor the idolatrous king Nebuchadnezzar, of course he threw them into the fire, having heated it seven times more than it was wont to be heated. But then the God of heaven tried to reach him yet again. Daniel 3, verse 24, the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, rose up in haste and spake and said to his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Nebuchadnezzar, profoundly affected by seeing the Son of God walking in the midst of the fire. How did Nebuchadnezzar know that this fourth being was like the Son of God. How did he know that? Holy Spirit impressed him, Dennis. Okay. Okay. Nelly, what were you going to say? Same thing. Okay. Had Daniel and his friends discussed with Nebuchadnezzar the coming of the Son of God? Had they discussed that with him? I'm sure they had too. I'm sure they had too. And in their lives, did these young men not represent the principles of the kingdom of heaven? They most surely did. They most surely did. So Nebuchadnezzar was convinced that the fourth one in that crematory, in that furnace, was the Son of God. Jesus walked in the fire. Yes, it was to save his faithful children in that battle with Babylon the Great. Yes, he was going to deliver them from those flames. But God had other intentions as well. It wasn't just about the preservation of those three young men in that fire that day. The God of heaven loved all those heathen, idolatrous people on the plains of Dura. And the God of heaven wanted to reach them with the truth of his saving power to change them. God loved all the princes and governors and captains and counselors. And he loved the idolatrous, proud, oppressive king that sat upon the throne. In verse 28, we read Nebuchadnezzar's second little story. 
Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Now from what Nebuchadnezzar said there, did he get the message that God was intending for him on the plains of Dora? Did he get the message? He didn't, did he? Whose God was it? Was it now Nebuchadnezzar's God? No, it wasn't. He didn't get it. He didn't get it. He said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It wasn't his God. It was their God. And who was this God of these three young men? Well, he was a deliverer. Is that the message that the Lord wanted Nebuchadnezzar to receive that day? That he was a deliverer? That he could save people from fire? The God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wanted Nebuchadnezzar to get this message. As I save them from the fire, so I can save you from yourself. But Nebuchadnezzar didn't hear that. He was a God that saved people from fire, but not from themselves. He could do it for others, but leave me alone. So Nebuchadnezzar, profoundly affected by what happened with the fiery furnace that day, still didn't get it. He still didn't get it. Because Nebuchadnezzar wasn't in the fire. And the God who delivered those boys was their God, not his. And so Nebuchadnezzar had to get a third message. It's interesting. And you see this repeatedly through Scripture. God sends three messages to people. Sends them three. Just as we see in Revelation 14, 6-12. The first one reveals His awesome power to save. The second one, when that is rejected, he sends warning. And then the third one is a final warning. Well, folk, God is infinitely patient, but he's also infinitely just. And so we find the third and final story in the life of the king of Babylon. It's found in Daniel chapter 4. Probably a story that we don't read that often. But this is it. Nebuchadnezzar, in verse 3 says, acknowledges the great high God that he has wrought towards him. Verse 2, he says, I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God has wrought towards me. So he was touched. Nebuchadnezzar was touched. How great are his signs. How mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. So Nebuchadnezzar's at a crossroads. He's, he's acknowledging the God of heaven. But at the same time, he's still acknowledging him and how great he is. Verse 5, 
Nebuchadnezzar says, I saw a dream which made me afraid. The thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a, de a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. In verse 10, Nebuchadnezzar, because the wise men of Babylon couldn't explain a thing. Verse 10 says, Thus were the visions of my head and my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth. The height thereof was great. The tree grew, was strong, the height thereof reached to heaven, the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. Verse 14, oh, 13, I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree, cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, scatter his fruit, let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron brass and the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's. Let a beast's heart be given to him. And let seven times pass over him. So Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this prosperous tree. Everybody was eating from it. The beast, the fowl, human being, everybody was feasting from this tree. But then the tree was cut down. Only the stump at the very bottom was to be left. And for seven years, this tree says, leave the stump of his roots even with a band of iron in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Now in verse 15, this tree begins to take on human. It's some human. It says, let his, his, that's a human, that's a male, a man. Let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man. So this tree represents a man and, and a kingdom. And let a beast's heart be given to him for seven years. Well, Daniel comes in, verses 20 and on, through verse 23. And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, the tree represents you. And for seven years, you will become like an animal. It's interesting. When we are not in submission to the authority of God, the best we can do is to be an animal. It's the best we can do, folks. when we are not in subjection to the will of God, we behave like animals. And Nebuchadnezzar behaved like an animal. The Bible says, verse 28 through 30, all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. He walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power for the honor of my majesty? So who was Nebuchadnezzar still worshiping? Himself. 
He was still the king. He was still the master. He was still in charge. He was still the great one. And it was time for him to be cut down. And he was. And for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar became an astonishment to the world, including a grandson that would go out and watch him through bars and watch him as his grandfather behaved like an animal. Unfortunately, that grandson didn't learn, didn't learn the lessons of God's amazing grace. So Nebuchadnezzar for seven years is crazy. For seven years, his hair grew like eagle's feathers, the Bible said. His nails were like bird's claws. Wow. Well, did Nebuchadnezzar learn the lesson? First it was your God to Daniel, and then it was the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Would Nebuchadnezzar finally learn of God's amazing grace for his life? Daniel 4 and verse 34, the Bible records for us. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes to heaven. My understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored Him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation. And verse 37, Nebuchadnezzar said, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven. All whose works are truth, his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Nebuchadnezzar finally learned the lesson. Praise God. Praise God. Finally learned to allow the King of Heaven to be the master of his life. You know, as human beings... We try so desperately to save those we love from suffering judgments, from suffering pain in this life. But the God of heaven uses pain. He used suffering. He used judgments. in order to bring salvation to this man's life. Let's be very careful how we deal with those who are suffering, those that are dealing with things in their lives that are difficult. Let's allow, let's allow the God of heaven to do His work in a difficult situation, let's allow the God of heaven to do that work. That the person who is suffering may receive the blessing that God has in store for them. Nebuchadnezzar learned of God's amazing grace. I pray, I pray that each one of us will analyze today, this week, who our God is. A God of prophecy? Somebody else's God? Or is He the God of my soul? 
Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you today. You worked for 40 years to save that man. You loved him so much. Thank you for the amazing ways in which you worked in his life. And Lord, if, if we're going to be honest, we can see how you've done the same for us. We haven't seen people walk in fire. And we haven't had somebody tell us a dream we had and interpret it. But Father, you've worked in amazing ways. I pray, Lord, that we would allow your gracious spirit to control us, to humble us, that you and you alone would be seen in our lives. Thank you that you worked long for that man and thank you that you do the same for us. May we extol and honor and give glory to the same king this morning as Nebuchadnezzar did when he learned of your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen.